morning. I'm Matthew Santoraco, a professor of classics here at NYU and the director of our Center for Ancient Studies. As those of you know who have participated in our activities over the years, the center was founded 25 years ago within the Faculty of Arts and Science to promote the interdisciplinary and cross-cultural study of the past. We do this by encouraging faculty and students in a variety of arts and science departments and programs, as well as in other schools and institutes of the university to collaborate with one another through curriculum, research projects, occasional publications, and international study grants for students. We also reach out to the larger scholarly community beyond NYU and to the general public. Thus the Aquila Theater is company in residence at the center. In addition, we have sponsored through the Faculty Resource Network, a series of summer and winter seminars that bring together faculty from colleges and universities around the country to study aspects of the ancient world. Finally, we reach an even larger public through our endowed annual conferences, of which today's event is one. These conferences explore areas where ancient and modern experiences intersect and where the perspectives offered by the past can help us analyze, understand, and perhaps even respond to contemporary challenges. Certainly the last year and a half have been replete with challenges. When the pandemic necessitated a sudden pivot to online work, the programming of our center not only shifted to Zoom, but also focused even more intently than before on larger societal issues that the pandemic revealed and exacerbated, and also on the role of the academy in addressing these. Thus, we inaugurated a series of webinars organized around the general rubric, Topics for Challenging Times, Ancient Perspectives on Modern Issues. Shorter in duration than our usual multi-day conferences, these took the format of panel discussions among distinguished scholars on such topics as elections, ancient and modern, monuments and memory, applied ancient studies, outreach, inclusivity, community, and of course, pandemics in antiquity and beyond. We also inaugurated a video series entitled Emerging Scholars, which is currently in production. Through a call for proposals, we are showcasing graduate students in the United States and internationally, whose work has the potential to move the study of antiquity forward, either by addressing new topics or by using new methodologies. And we're eager to include scholars from groups that have been or still are underrepresented in the field and in the academy as a whole. For this current year, while the university has returned safely to in-person instruction, the center's events will continue to be online or hybrid. This is in part because the university's public health guidelines make it difficult to host large events with outside guests and visitors. But we also discovered in the past year and a half that online programming not only enabled us to bring in speakers from distant locations, but also made it possible for many more people again from far-flung locations and in different circumstances to attend our events. These considerations of increased participation, access and equity will inform discussions by the center's faculty advisory committee this year as they think through what the right mix of modalities might be for our future programming. This week's Ranieri Colloquium at least will be in webinar format. Future events that we're planning include two major international conferences, one on archeological discoveries at Caesarea Maritima under the auspices of the Rothschild Foundation, and another on the comparative study of ancient emotions. Please stay tuned. If you're interested in attending these or any of the center's events, please check out our website. The website also contains an up-to-date calendar of lectures, exhibitions, and conferences at NYU that are related to antiquity, whether or not they are sponsored by the center. And if you would like to be put on our mailing list, I encourage you to sign up and you can do that on the website as well. But now let's turn to today's event, our Ranieri Colloquium on Work-Life, 
institutions, subjectivities, and human resources in the ancient world. Focusing on visual and literary representations of labor in ancient Rome, a multidisciplinary group of scholars from the United States and Europe will explore how work was conceptualized and experienced in antiquity, a topic that has relevance not only to the ancient world, but also we think to work and labor issues in contemporary societies. This event represents a departure from past Ranieri colloquia in several respects. First, learning from the experience of our webinar series, we have organized this event in shorter sessions spread over three days. We hope that this will forestall conference and or Zoom fatigue, but also accommodate people whose circumstances might not allow them to devote an entire day or a day and a half to attending a conference. A second departure from precedent is that this conference was organized not out at NYU alone, but by individuals from two different institutions, our own and the University of Pennsylvania. And it grew out of a research collaboration that these individual scholars had formed. In addition, the conference was, in a sense, prepared for by a series of five intellectually stimulating workshops that were held last year. Finally, the two scholars who organized the workshops and this conference were graduate students, our own Del Matichik and from Penn at the time, Jordan Rogers. And I'll say a word about both of them in a moment. But when they presented this idea, the Ancient Studies Advisory Committee was enthusiastic. And this conference aligns with the other initiative I described earlier, our commitment to showcase and empower emerging scholars who are after all, the future of our field. The format of this Ranieri Colloquium, which will be observed today, tomorrow, and on Friday, will be as follows. Each session will begin with a brief introduction of a specific theme, after which the moderator will introduce the speakers. After their presentations, the moderator will facilitate a discussion among the panelists and with the audience. If you have a question that you would like to ask our speakers, you can use the Zoom webinars Q&A function, which appears at the bottom of your computer screen. I wanna take this opportunity to thank our alumnus, benefactor, and dear personal friend, Sal Ranieri, who endowed this annual conference and has in so many other ways been supportive of the work of our center over the years. I want to thank also Dell and Jordan for organizing such an intellectually stimulating program. To all our speakers for agreeing to contribute their expertise and to all of you on this webinar who have set aside time to participate in this event. Finally, as always, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Maura Pollard, our center's program administrator who has set up this webinar and has worked tirelessly on all aspects of today's program. Now, I'd like to start the proceedings by introducing the organizers of this event. Del Matichik is a doctoral candidate and Dean's Dissertation Fellow of the NYU Graduate School of Arts and Science. His primary research lies in Hellenistic and Roman literature and its reception, with a focus on problems of ecology, materiality, and subjectivity. His dissertation, Raw Materiality and the Poetics of Energy in Augustan Literature, draws on a wide range of ancient and contemporary theories of matter to reconsider how materia mediates the relationship between bodies, things, and ideas in the works of Virgil and his contemporaries. Dell has chapters and articles forthcoming on Virgil, Propertius, Ovid, Ausonius, Hygienus Grammaticus, and is currently organizing panels, workshops, and conferences on topics ranging from Roman conceptions of labor to global Ovidianism. He's also interested in the role of graduate students and other precarious members of the academy in discussions about the future of classics. And he has co-authored a prognosis of the future of classics graduate study after COVID-19. He currently represents graduate students as a member at large of the Society for Classical Studies Board of Directors. Jordan Rogers earned his PhD in ancient history 
from the University of Pennsylvania. He is currently visiting assistant professor of classics at Carleton College. In his first book project titled Making Neighbors, Urban Community in Republican Rome, Jordan focuses primarily on the dynamics of urban community formation and maintenance at the city of Rome through a novel engagement with the methodological and analytical frameworks of urban sociologists and folklorists, combining these approaches with the more traditional tools and sources available to the ancient historian, from the comedies of Plautus to the epigraphic record. This interest in how communities are created has led to a second project in which Jordan will explore more fully the robust and diverse economies of urban communities. So Dell and Jordan, I think now the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, first off, I have to say that this conference and many of the things that Matthew mentioned I'm involved in uh, would not have been possible without your uh, support and encouragement over the last um, several years. I can't estimate how much I've benefited from your mentorship um, since I arrived at NYU in 2015, and I'm, I'm delighted that we can bring this conference together as a small monument to what support like that from faculty members can bring to fruition. I would also like to thank the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Ancient Studies, which co-sponsored the digital workshop that was the precursor to this conference last year. Uh, we appreciate the center's willingness to lend their name to an unusual project in the chaotic time of the height of the pandemic in 2020. Finally, of course, I'll echo Matthew and give special thanks to the inimitable Maurer Pollard, whose competence is matched only by her patience, who is the organizational mastermind um, behind this web the technical aspects of this webinar. Uh, let me briefly describe the order of affairs for the next three days. Each panel will be conducted as a webinar like this. Each speaker will talk for approximately 30 minutes, and this will be followed by another 25 to 30 minutes of discussion. The speakers, moderators, and organizers will be on screen at all times, and we will start a discussion um, among them before opening it up to the broader Q&A. If you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A function. The moderator will receive your questions and share with the panelists. Our speakers are a highly multi multidisciplinary group of historians, archaeologists, and philologists representing different professional levels and institutions in the US and Europe. The panels we have convened are diverse both in terms of method and subject matter, but are nonetheless uh, alike in uh, broad themes and common questions. In today's panel, our speakers consider different forms that constellate around knowledge of different Roman professional groups. Caroline Chung, considers different places and ways craftsmen learn skills and techniques through dolium repairs. Claire Holleran reminds us that professional knowledge enabled and often required different levels of physical mobility throughout the Roman world and follows some wandering workers through these motions. Drawing among, among other things on contemporary theories of stereotype formation, Jane Sanchonito considers how Roman merchants responded to stereotypes, not only about their professions, but about more conventionally elite professions as well. Tomorrow, our first panel, chaired by Danel Padilla Peralta, considers postmortem entanglements of work and life. Rebecca Sosville considers the rhetoric of civic commemoration in monuments for intellectuals of Roman cities in Asia Minor. John Bodell turns to the Romanary funerary trade then and reconsiders the history of how the social and professional are bound up in the figure of the praefica and the historical evolution of professional mourners. In session three, chaired by Emilia, Emilia Barbiero, our speakers turn back to prose texts and discuss matters left unspoken in two literary job descriptions. In the first case, Joseph Howley considers how the character of the Vilcus as a slave with some autonomy and power over other slaves poses a problem to the logical structures of power in the Roman villa. Then Nicole Gianella follows the escape of one of Cicero's literary assistants and considers how that assistant wrestles with the conflict between his personal and professional responsibilities. Friday's session will be devoted to visual art and poetry. Our fourth session moderated um, by um, uh, 
uh, excuse me, uh, Lauren Peterson, features two different studies of how images testify to communities of labor. And Kuttner considers how a wide range of Roman visual arts testify to the existence of an aesthetics of expertise in what she calls a culture of competence. Jordan Rogers turns to a specific visual artifact, the Fabri Tignarii relief, and offers a detailed analysis of cultural and religious aspects of labor it depicts. Finally, session five, moderated by Nandini Pandai, turns to poetry and considers how accounts of making and makerliness morph into accounts of how individuals are caught up in systems of power. In my paper, which opens the panel, I will consider how Virgilian configurations of the relationship between labor and vitae, labor and life, echo in the tradition of bibliography biographies of the poet Virgil, as well as in contemporary discourses about what it means to do the work of classical philology. Tom Goy turns the anonymous moratum and explores how it shed lights on, sheds light on the power dynamics inherent in Roman theories of metaphor. Finally, Marco Formisano ends it off um, by offering an elegant reading of Ovid's Arachne, considering how her metamorphosis into a spider also figures the transformation of work into labor. Now to provide a little bit more of the intellectual background for our project, I turn it over to my co-organizer, Jordan Rogers. Thank you. Thank you, Dell. Um, thank you, Matthew, as well. And thanks to everyone who's been joining us here, the participants, panelists, as well as the general attendees who are with us this morning. So often considerations of the relationship between work and life and ancient Rome begin with one of two texts. The first is Cicero's infamous and oft quoted aside in De Officiis, in which the orator offers his thoughts as to which occupations befitted the honorable man's life and which occupations were considered sordid. The second is Virgil's ambivalent claim in the first Georgic that outrageous labor conquers all things, labor omnia winket in probus, which is taken either to be a lament about how fallen man is doomed to toil to stay alive or a celebration of the power of human striving to dominate the natural world. In both passages, work is shaped by and manifests stark hierarchical differences between the living. Unsurprisingly, trades occupied by the lower classes in the Ciceronian picture, the butcher, the fishmonger, the carpenter, rank the lowest. Teachers and doctors, given their useful knowledge, are counted some measure of respect. Atop the hierarchy, of course, is the individual whose profits from Mediterranean trade are funneled into the ownership of agricultural land. It is no coincidence that Cicero himself resembles this very individual, saddled atop the socioeconomic and moral hierarchy of Roman society. In Virgil's aphorism, whether read optimistically or pessimistically, figures Labor as a violent conqueror of plant, animal, and man. We are fortunate that recent engagements with how Romans constructed ideologies of Labor have become more disciplined in critically interpreting the likes of Cicero and Virgil. For instance, in a recent volume, Work, Labor, and Professions in the Roman World, edited by Conrad Verboven and Christian Lees, contributions by Nicholas Tran, Katarina Lees, and Hugo Soli, building on the work of Sandra Joshua and Paul Vane, offer convincing revisions to Moses Finley's status-based model of the Roman economy, a model which established as normative the passage of Deo Ficci's Just Considered. Our own Tom Goy's damning study of the slaver's ideology of the Georgics reminds us that plenty of Romans were not conquered by labor themselves, as Virgil would say, but instead leached off that of others. What all of these studies share is a simple shift in perspective. It may have been the case that the literature producing aristocracy of the Roman Empire, Cicero and Virgil among them, disparaged labor and those performing it. But that was not an opinion shared by the lower or even perpetually difficult, if not impossible, to define quote unquote middle class who it is apparent identified with and took pride in their occupations. Several monographs and volumes published in the past decade prove this point. These investigations have begun reframing the discussion of Roman labor, placing less emphasis on its quantitative economic value in favor of exploring how the cultural discourse of work, the identification, definition, and articulation of skill and professional duty in both literature and art, and the organization of labor practices and workshops indelibly affected other aspects of Roman society, including the cultural, the aesthetic, and the social realms of Roman life. This shift in perspective reminds us that the diverse forms that labor took in Rome 
must be studied together, not as disparate ranks in a status hierarchy, but as scattered nodes caught in a dense web of interrelation. So our goal in bringing together this colloquium's interdisciplinary array of speakers is to contribute to this growing conversation by tracing the dynamic relationship between work and life in the Roman world. Of particular interest in our period is the increasing abstraction and institutionalization of the so-called job, divorced from the concrete actions of the job holder by the explicit delineation of associated skills, duties, and responsibilities. One question with which all participants grapple to some extent in their papers is what purpose these descriptions of the job serve, both in practical and cultural terms. Such impetus to define one's job is of course not unfamiliar to many of us here, who have browsed through hundreds, if not thousands for some of us, of job descriptions in our own, sometimes Sisyphean search to remunerate our labor. And as we understand it, this practice of defining the elements, the activities, tasks, and duties of a job is the product of modern industrial and organizational psychologies that underpin human resources departments in the Western corporation. And the very title of this conference, in fact, Work Life, is partly inspired by the numerous efforts by employers to dictate what constitutes each realm of work and of life, usually through a series of emails that you probably still have in your inbox, blog posts, or even workshops. But we can, in fact, identify a similar phenomenon occurring in the ancient Mediterranean, where the realities of an increasingly complex economy necessitated greater precision in the language and organization of work. On the one hand, such descriptions serve a useful and practical hermeneutic function in establishing expectations, communicating professional proficiencies, and connecting individuals to jobs. On the other hand, they also necessarily reify the job as a durable abstract concept in itself, disassociating the work performed from the individuals performing it. Paradoxically then, the individual desire to communicate the substance of one's work simultaneously serves to erase the worker, whether through depictions of tools and work in funerary art, the training of apprentices and workshops, the responsibilities of the villicus, or even the emphasis in Hellenistic and Augustan literature on metapoetic, metapoetic imagery that draws readerly eyes to the elaborate intertextual architecture of texts. Hannah Arendt has suggested that this desire to define and perform functions and roles effaces the individual entirely, reducing us to the base sameness of humanity. And how precisely this phenomenon manifests in the Roman Mediterranean is therefore of principal concern to our colloquium. Throughout our discussion in the workshops and um, in this conference, there have been two figures that have emerged as particularly useful ciphers for Roman work life that furnish alternatives to the Ciceronian gratus discussed above and the brutality of Virgilian labor. And these figures are the Willicus and the spider. Discussions of the Willicus illuminate the tensions inherent in defining and performing a job and how they reverberate throughout a culture. One of the earliest job descriptions in Latin literature can be found in the second century BCE agricultural treatise De Agricultura, in which the author, Cato the Elder, defines the responsibilities and duties of the enslaved farm overseer and his wife. Cato's prescriptions are partially aspirational, but they reveal the unspoken legal relationships and de definitions that often characterized Roman labor in the ancient world, even if these relationships were not always explicitly articulated. The second figure, that of the spider, invites us to reflect on the power of work as a literary and cognitive metaphor. The metaphor of work and the work of metaphor has become another major point of interest throughout our discussions, from the description of merchants and other trades as filthy, sordidus, to the metaphor of work as political control, religious propitiation, or literary tradition building. Whereas the study of metapoetic metaphors in Roman literature has above all been preoccupied with delineating formal resemblances between tenor and vehicle, our papers collectively endeavor to disentangle and contrast the tenors and vehicles in key metaphors and consider their implicit ideological ramifications. For instance, long recognized as a programmatic symbol for the delicacy and grace of post kalimachian poetics, the spider web in our conference becomes instead a site of arachnophobic angst and a fabrication of mindless sameness that contrasts with the dynamism and plurality of a literary or fabric text. 